come? Okay. Hey, folks. Good evening. Glad to see so many of you here. I appreciate that. I like it when people get involved. So um, I would like to open this meeting and please stand for the pledge and then the invocation by Pastor Reed. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of you please give the invocation? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for another opportunity to come together and discuss issues and, and things that will affect our beautiful town here of Oakland. We seek your wisdom and we seek your guidance. We pray, Lord, that you would simply instill within us the decisions that need to be made and give us your divine insight. This we ask this evening, as you continue to smile gracefully upon our beautiful town, we thank you in advance for your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was very nice. All right, Elise. What I did is I provided the handout, what the PowerPoint of, but it looks like this. I brought the hard copy in. Um, so if you have any questions over this book or this one or anything in general, just stop me and, and ask me what we can do. Okay. okay, we're good. Yeah, it's not auto proof. I don't know what I did. <laughs> You just want me to have you advance it. It's, uh... Yeah, let me just. Sorry. We lost audio for three seconds. The, uh, well, you'll find, I'll just go over this page. On the very first page, page two of the handouts, you can see we have our summary of our reports. There's five different reports embedded in the financial statements. Um, each one of them, uh, pretty much two pages or one that's one page, but there's a lot of information. I hope you've read through it. If not, just go read through it and see what we have to say as auditors and, and auditor speak, which is in the, uh, in the report. So I'm going to give you a summary of it. So the bullet points you have here are the very first report you're going to find in the financial statements. And it's, it's at the beginning. It's on page one and two of this book. And it's at the beginning because it's the most important report. This is where we're going to give you an opinion on the financial statements. And by that, I mean the numbers and the presentations and what the financial statement footnotes say about the town and their activity. Uh, we give it to you in this, in this report. Uh, every entity that's audited in the United States gets a report that looks just, just like this. It's required by the AICPA. So any audit gets an audit report like this. And you can see the very top bullet point there is the result of the audit is an unmodified opinion 
on the financial statement. So in our opinion, we're telling you that you can rely on financial statements. We have no qualification of that opinion. We're not going to say you can rely on the financial statements except for this item. We're not telling you you can't rely on the financial statements. We're giving you a clean opinion, is what we call it. Uh, it's the highest level of assurance we can give you as auditors. Uh, you can see that second bullet point there. We're not telling you that you're in good financial shape or bad financial shape when you get a clean opinion. What we're telling you is the information that follows one and two is a fair representation of what actually took place during the year. Uh, we do have to report the third bullet point there. Anytime there's a change in accounting principles, we have to report that to you. And no one uh, likes to talk or listen. I'll love to talk about it. No one likes to listen to discussions about accounting principles, but there was a change this year called fiduciary activities. Uh, if the town per, uh, participates in a fiduciary activity, that gets reported in a, two separate pages in the financials, and you do participate in a fiduciary activity. This had to do with impact fees you collect on behalf of the Orange County Public School System. You collect them for them, you know, and as you issue permits, you send that money to the district. So that's a change in the financial statements. You want more information? You can go to note 15 of the financials and read about it. Um, next year, we're going to have a big one. I'm just going to prime you now. It's called leases. It changes how all local governments report leases. So we're going to have, there's going to be some significant changes next year as well. So um, that, that's the reports on page one and two. Now, if you go to the back of the financials, starting on page 49, you're going to have several government um, type of compliance reports. The first one on 49.50 is uh, internal control and compliance report. Uh, this is a set of standards required by the federal government. They're federal government auditing standards. And I've been asked, why are we being audited under federal standards? And that's because the Florida Auditor General says you are. So we have to apply these standards to our audit of the town. And in this report, we're going to tell you any noncompliance that we find. This material, that's significant. Noncompliance, uh, small noncompliance, large noncompliance or internal control deficiencies that are a material weakness or a significant deficiency. And this is important. So you know that, uh, did the auditors find any weaknesses in our internal controls? Now, we don't do an internal control effectiveness study or anything like that. That's way more robust. What we're doing is while we're doing our work to achieve the objectives on page one and two, you know, can we issue an opinion on these financials? If we know things that are deficiency, we report them to you in this report. But we do have two material weaknesses in internal control to report here. I'm going to go over those into the handout. Uh, there was one of those in the prior year, and there are no significant deficiencies this year where there was one in the prior. So there's two findings this year, two last year. That means there was one new one this year, and one of last year's fell off as management corrects it. And I'll go over that when we go over the findings. Um, but no uh, noncompliance to report in this, um, in this uh, government auditing standards report. On page 51, third bullet point here, is going to be our compliance report with section 218415 of the Florida statutes, a very specific compliance requirement by the Auditor General, and this has to do with your investment of public funds. We have to go look at how you're investing it and determine if it's in compliance with the Florida statutes, and it will be noted no nonsense. Uh, page 52 and 53 is our management letter. Again, a lot of governments in other states don't get a management letter. Uh, Auditor General of the State of Florida says you'll have one, and so you have one on page 52 and 53. In this report, we have two compliance findings and recommendations to report. Now, these are compliance less than material. These aren't big non-compliance issues. These are smaller non-compliance issues to report. And these are repeats from last year. We had no new findings in the management letter. So the items that are in the management letter are uncorrected findings from last year. And then the last report that you get is loose in the back of the financial statements. It doesn't have any pages on it. It's just separate. This is called the governance letter. This is required by the AICPA. Every entity audit in the United States gets one. And it's a communication between me and the board for non-quantitative type items. You know, we talk a lot about significant deficiencies and, and whether the numbers are reliable or not. But this gives us an opportunity to tell you, are we having any disagreements with management? Are we having any problems getting the audit done? We talk a little bit about estimates in there. We talk a little bit about uh, what an audit is and what it isn't. Please read through that governance letter. Uh, the three bullet points here are the most important disclosures in there. One, we had no disagreements with management. We always have a great working relationship with management. Uh, no difficulties encountered while performing our audit. 
And the third bullet point is disclosure of material audit adjustments. That's a requirement by this governance letter. So any adjustments that we make to the records that are significant, we disclose to you in there. So you can see some of the adjustments that we're making because a lot of people think an auditor and accountant are the same thing. It's not. An audit is a double check function, right? Um, we really, in a perfect world, we go in and do an audit and not make one adjustment. We would say, wow, these books are fairly presented as we were given them. Any, you know, any accounting that we're doing, we have to track it. And if we do enough accounting that it's almost like we're auditing our own work, then we have to report a finding that's finding. Because if you go to each one of these reports, you'll see the word independent auditor in every one of them, right? We have to be independent, right? I can't audit my own work. My kids don't audit their own chores, that kind of a thing. The, um, so we have to be independent. And if we make enough material audit adjustments, we get close to you know, shading that line between auditor and auditee, accountant and auditor kind of thing. So there are some uh, journal entries in there. I know that's also no fun to look at as journal entries, but if you want to look at them there in the back um, of that report. All right, that's the summary of our reports. Any questions on those reports? I think it's some findings uh, at the end. Okay, if we can advance one slide. Um, I'm going to go over these briefly. I know you've had the handouts. So I'm going to go over them rather quickly. They're the same uh, graphs that I go over every year. I just eliminated two of them that seem to be, they didn't seem to be necessary in the big picture. Um, what this is, this is just a picture of the reporting entity. The town of Oakland is the circle. It's split into by governmental activities and business type activities. And, you know, just in the name, you know what that means. Over here, business type, we have our enterprise fund, right? Water and sewer utility fund. Everything else on the governmental side, right? Charter schools over there. Impact fees is over there in the general fund. Just gives you an idea. It's a good roadmap to go to before you open up the financials because you're going to see these wording, this wording in there throughout. So um, on the next page, on page five, no one can see that on the screen, I know. Um, what I did is I took a snip from page 12 of the audit document, just to give you an idea of why I don't go over the financial. I mean, you can see there's sort of four columns. There's, you know, 25 or 30 rows on this. Just a ton of information on this. But the reason I wanted to put it on a slide, I want you to look at that third line from the bottom. I've highlighted it there. When someone asks you your level of reserves and your governmental activities, that's the number you're going to want to go to. You don't want to go at the top. Look at that very top number on the right. Look at that cash number, $6.6 million. That's a not a fair representation of your unrestricted reserves, you know, because a lot of that's restricted. So you go to that third line from the bottom and you have that number. There's $1.2 million. So if someone were to ask you, um, uh, say, at a, at, a, at a meeting of um, county commissioners, let's say, and they wanted to know what your reserves were that tell them at 930 2021 for your governmental funds. Now you see that section right above it, that right above that bottom highlighted number. If you ever want to know what's in those restricted accounts, there's a lot of them. They're all right there. They're in the bottom, like right in this area right here. So you can open up financials if you ever wanted to know where your restricted money was, because you have a lot of it and it kind of shows you where it's at. But I just kind of want to focus on financial health. That's what I do. I can go into in depth about anything, but I just want to focus on financial health at first. And so that's the number you look at, that 1.2 million. But you know, is that good or bad is the question at this point, right? I don't know. It's got a dollar sign in front of it. So I don't know if it's good or bad, right? But if you're, I always use Tampa as my example. They have, their general fund goes through a million dollars every day. So if you that was your reserves in Tampa, you wouldn't be in very good shape. You'd have a day of reserves and then you would be out. So we have to look at that number relative to the town itself. And what we do is we compare it to your expense. Dave Ramsey type number. This is your emergency reserve. We take your annual expenses and divide it into your reserves. And we come up with the graph that's on the very next page and it's up on the screen on page six of the handout. And the town of Oakland is the blue line. And that number we come up with is that far right number in the 2021 column, 16%. Right, so you have sixteen percent of your annual expenses set aside in unrestricted reserves at the end of the year. That's two months, right? So, um, if you were to receive not a dollar from anywhere in the general fund, you could run for two months at the same level of reserves. To give you an idea of the how sufficient that is, 
Uh, there's a rule of thumb that this number should never be below 15, it's really 16%. It should never be below two months. The GFOA, which is a government finance officers association that set forth this number, setting this minimum. And, you know, we've talked about this in the past because this is the best financial condition the town has been for some time. You know, you can tell that it's higher than it has been on any of the six years presented, but you can probably go back another five and it's higher than that because it's something we as auditors have always been worried about, um, about the sufficiency of the reserves in the uh, governmental funds. So I'm happy it's above the 2%. Um, a lot of towns will have maybe a 25% target on this number. So you got to think, you know, in this inflationary environment, it's much higher than the CPI new number that's reported you know, the, on, uh, by the government, because I, I actually subscribe to the city county um, cost index, and that's at about 13%. This is the actual counties and cities and towns that are part of a cooperative, and they put in what they're paying for goods and services and track. We track that, because that's what the Auditor General uses as a gauge for city inflation, and uh, that's at about 13%. So 25% uh, an attainable goal? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, it might not happen overnight, right? But yeah, it absolutely is. You know, you build it into your budget. Instead, you know, you say, well, I'm going to have revenues that are a little more than my expenditures each year until I get up to 25%. Um, and, you know, but that, that's just a rule of thumb, kind of a target is, you know, the, the minimum is the, like the floor. It's like the earth when you're flying an airplane, right? That's the minimum you can fly. Is that You don't really want to fly right at ground level. You need to want to fly 25%, not 16%. Yes. So you're saying that the target for a lot of towns is 25%. Yes. How come the peer group is like 76.61%? Well, that's the important thing. I was going to get to the peer groups. What I do is I compare the town of Oakland to like-sized municipalities in the state of Florida. I stratify all of the municipality by population to set up your fund structure like we looked at earlier in your population. And then I, yeah, that's 14 peers that you have. And then we just average them. Why, there's some cities that have 200%, and that skews this average top. It really does. So we're not saying that that's where you want to be. That's just where your peers are at. you know. And I do have a handout that actually has individual data on your peers. And every time I'm asked that, it's usually two or three because it's a simple average. Right? It's just I add them all up and divide it by 14, and that's the average for your peers. It's really high. You know, there is a way you could get too high, right? If you get... If you had 100%, someone, you know, a citizen could say, hey, we're being overtaxed. You don't need 100%. The general fund's not there to make money, distribute to shareholders, that kind of thing. You know, it's there to run operations, plan for emergencies, and to have a reserve on hand for when those emergencies arise, in my opinion. That's what I think of. It's not like an enterprise fund who's there to generate equity. But I, I, would, I would take, you see these dotted lines that are in prior months, because we've always had to do these caveats in these, you know, well, this grant money's coming in next year, and oh, we had this CD, you know, that was in the general fund secured by a debt in the enterprise fund. So we always had to do these reconciliations just to get it up to 6%. You can see on the far left. So a 16% is a very positive number. I think you went up from 4 to 16%. And I think, and you'll see when I'm done, structurally, structurally, I think the town is there. I think it's built and ready to go. So I think this is going to improve without a whole lot of... Um, any other type of work. It's just kind of like be patient, budget it into the uh, budget, and, and you'll be, at, you know, you'll be at a, at a higher fund balance. I just in an inflationary position, you know, if you're at 16% of your expenses and your expenses go up 10%, even if you did nothing else, you'd be at 6% next year, right? Because 10% would be wasted away to inflation. So the, um, that's important to think about. The, um, if we can advance the slide, one more slide. Um, as I showed you the financial statement for the governmental funds, I also just want to show it to you for the enterprise fund. We, we do the same thing. It's a statement of your assets at the top, liabilities in the middle, and what's left over, which is the difference between the two at the bottom called net position or your equity. But again, look at all those numbers and captions. There's a lot of moving pieces on here. And you can't talk about any one of those items without talking about other items. So what I do is the same thing. Look at the second line from the bottom. You can get your unrestricted reserves right there in one line. That says it all. That's every bit of your unrestricted assets less every liability you have payable from unrestricted and that's the unrestricted balance in the enterprise fund. So that's 
of $1,041,000. Again, is that good or bad? No one can even answer that, right? Unless we look at the level of activity in the enterprise fund. So we do that, we take a look at the enterprise fund and we're gonna look at revenue here. The enterprise fund for 2021 build a little over $2 million in revenue. That's significant. I believe when I started auditing this town, it was billing maybe $300,000 a year in water revenue. So it's a two million significant change. But what we do is we take that $2 million as a proxy for the level of activity in the enterprise fund divided into that unrestricted reserve. And we get the number you can see here on page eight, 51%, six months, right? We can just simplify that down to if your water and sewer customers stop paying you on 10 ones, you could run until March 31st at the same level of service. So just that idea is you can run for six months and the level of service, that's a pretty strong number. And you can see you're right in line with your peers. Uh, these are going to oscillate around, of course. Um, as you see, you've oscillated around in these six months, but your, your reserves are fairly steady here. Now I'm going to show you in a minute. Your enterprise fund is um, it's generating positive cash flow. It has a good operating profit, so it's poised to operate like you wanted to, to be able to generate enough cash flow to pay its operations and to pay a dividend to the general fund to transfer. Nothing wrong with transfers to the general fund. In fact, if, if we didn't have this fund structure, you wouldn't have to make a transfer, right? Because the general fund would have a water department and have a sewer department. So just this fact that the, the standards require, we chop it up. Enterprise fund over here and general fund over here. The way you equalize that is a transfer, see? I always look at it like a, a normal household, right? There's one provider may work in the house, take care of the house, take care of the kids in the house and do those kind of things that don't generate money, but are still very important. And you get one that's outside of the house, works outside, gets paid a wage. Cash flow, that's the enterprise fund. This is the general fund. And you know, when they come home, transfers made, right? Transfer from one to the other in the bank account. To pay that happens to me a lot. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, steer clear is quick myself. I could go on for a while, but yeah. Anyway, that's the way to look. I, I have a lot of uh, clients that are hesitant to make an interplant transfer because they think that that's something wrong with them. And it's not. It's standard municipal finance. Is the enterprise fund runs at a cash positive cash flow, transfers the dividend to the general fund. Um, so I picked for the uh, enterprise fund uh, six months of reserves. Uh, we can introduce one more. Um, on this page, we're just taking a quick look at the, the operations of the enterprise fund. And see, just take a look at the 21 column. There's a lot of information on there. But there's your operating revenue at the top, a little over $2 million. It's, it's close to flat from last year. Um, you'd be surprised when we're doing an audit, you're in a growth situation like you are, we would expect revenue to go probably about as much as your number of customers went up, right? It didn't happen. Uh, your customers went up about 10%. Water revenue was essentially flat. And, and the reason being is consumption was down. Consumption per resident was lower than the prior year. So while your customers went up 10%, consumption per resident went down about 7 So the- um, We actually want that. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. That's not- Could be we had more rainfall and less irrigation and- uh, We sure yeah, had a lot of rain. rain. Yeah. Uh, for this water fund is working. Pretty wet year, so there was right that, that has a lot to do with it. The um uh, operating expenses you can see they're up nine percent. Like I say, there's going to be inflation built into everything you look at when it comes to expenses in this area. Now, you do know that in 20 um 2021, the town commission passed a um a, a I believe it was a resolution stopping the CPI index on your for 2021. It stopped it for one year. Uh, we haven't done any auto for 2022, but that should be back in effect now that that gets increased by the CPIU. And it's important. I know people don't want to do it to their customers, but it's built into your expenses. They're going to be going up at that rate. You know, so you, you, to maintain the ratio between revenue and expenses, I'm going to show it to you on the next page, you, you, they have to stay in sync. If not, you can get a situation where your operating expenses actually your revenue, and we're out of that situation where you can build reserves. We're using reserves again at that point. But if you see the graph up at the bottom, it's your it's your operating um, profit ratio, and you can see it's calculated here at the top. But it's at sixteen percent. 
Uh, that means for every dollar of revenue that the enterprise fund builds, it has 16 cents of every one of those dollars left over to go to pay debt service, make it transfer, do capital expansion, that kind of thing. And the most important with that number is the trend at the bottom. You can kind of see your trend there. Look at your peers. Your peers are right around flat. This is an enterprise fund. This is supposed to be a positive number. You know, and, and the reason being is you do have a lot, you know, there's some peers out there that operate at a pretty big loss uh, just because of stuff like depreciation and things like that. But I just want you to look at the town numbers there. You can kind of see that improvement, right? It was This was at a number for a couple of years. And, you know, the dotted line is taking out those startup costs with the sewer. You see the effect that the sewer department coming online had on those last two years, 2016 and 17. 20, negative 30%, even after you tick that out, it's still flat, you know, changes were made in 2018 and you can see the profits kind of declined a little bit each year. And that's just going to be because spent expenses are outrunning uh, the revenue increases. But I want to show you on the next page, I, I break down those two components of that operating profit, right? Blue is operating revenue per resident, green operating expense per revenue. And so, of course, the difference between those two lines is going to be a profit per resident. You see how that's narrowed in 2021? So that's really going to have a lot to do with the one rate didn't increase, but of course, you know, in your expenses, it's in there. That green line's got a 9% increase in it. The blue line has no increase in it. So you see how they narrow. So that's what we want to watch, because if you go back in between 2017 and 2018, that's when it crossed over. At that point, you started having more revenue than you did expenses per resident. So um, just to give you an idea of the components of that operating profit. Uh, last, before we go over the findings on the next page, it's just a schedule of your cash flow. And this is what's most important in the enterprise fund, right? Is the blue line is your operating cash flows. That's all the money that you brought in from customers. That's the $2 million minus what you paid to run the enterprise fund, no accruals, no payables, no depreciation in this number, strictly cash flow, it generated a positive $673,000. That little red bar is your debt service. Really relative to the amount of cash flow you have your debt in your enterprise fund is relatively low. It's about $117,000 a year. So that green line is what's left over after your debt service. $564,000 positive cash flow for the year. We just looked at your reserves in both funds. They're both a little over a million dollars. The enterprise fund's pulling in $500,000 of operating cash flow in one year. So, you know, that, that money can go for a lot of things. It can go for capital expansions. It can go for an interfund transfer, that kind of thing. But this gives you a gauge that the enterprise fund appears to be running really well right now. Um, we turn the next page. I'll go over the findings. Uh, it's broken up into two sections. Prior year findings are at the top. Current year findings are, are at the bottom. Uh, I want you to look at number 10 06. It's right through there is the second one. This is the finding that's been on the books at 10 is 2010. So it's been on there for over 10 years. And if you remember last year, there was one that had been on there for 12 years. They got cleared last year. So the big this restricted cash monitoring has now been corrected. So good job. I'm on the town. Remember, I think about all those restricted monies you have. Well, those have to be accounted. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of restricted money accounted open. So uh, unless those were being accounted for properly, we had this finding. That's been correct. So good job. Um, finding 10-05 is still one where we are making too many large journal entries. And I do think this year um, the town has hired a consultant, a financial reporting officer type consultant. Uh, I think they came online and, and she's really good at what she does. I work with her at two other jobs and um, just came online a little bit late in the process to get done by June 30th. So we, we, were, we were both working in the process at the same time, not just the town, but the financial reporting consultant and us as auditors were working through this project. But as, as you were to look through this report here that has those audit adjustments in it, you'll see we made too many audit adjustments this year that were big. So finding 10 to 5 remains. Uh, there's two findings. These were those, remember those findings that I said were compliance related, just not material, smaller non-compliance. Those are the 2020-001 and 002. Uh, 001 has to do with capital asset inventory. Florida Administrative Code requires the town to inventory its capital assets. 
you know, it's your property, your plant, your equipment um, every year. And that, so that needs to take place. That hasn't been done. And uh, then budgetary control. Um, the budget after the smoke cleared and all of those adjustments I talked about were made, uh, the budget was overexpended. Not by a lot, but any over expenditure of the budget, if your budgeted amount is less than what you actually spent on an accrual basis, um, that's a technically violation of the first statute. So that, that remains as well as 2020-002. And, and the way there is real no way for the town this year to address that, because really to make an accurate budget amendment, your records need to be accurate, right? And you only have 60 days after the end of the year to make your budget amendment. So that's November 29th is the deadline. So you really have to have your books ready at or near the end of the year, or at least as close as possible to make an accurate budget amendment. Then you make a budget amendment and then you're good, right? So uh, this just happens when sometimes audit adjustments will push the expenditures over what if, you know, management thought they were at 9.30. We finished the audit on June 30th of um, this year. So it was nine months from the end of the actual fiscal year. So you see what I mean? We, we, we found that it's a expenditure in June, you know, when uh, if, the, if, if you had a chance to address it, it would have been in November. I don't know what it was. The, um, <clears throat> and the current year recommendation has to do with bank reconciliations. Uh, this year, you know, I know a lot of the trouble with a lot of the accounting had to do with the accounting system. Uh, you know, if you have a bad system, it's not going to operate properly. It's going to be hard to run. And uh, the town went to a new system this year, and there's... I've seen them plan well. I've seen it planned by a lot of people. I've had an entire town staff in on the planning and going and getting it ready to implement and software implementation just never. I don't think it's possible, but yeah, that's what happened. Um, there were some issues with the system set up and it being able to produce accurate bank reconciliation reports. So I know the town was on top of it. They were in the middle of wrapping it up when we were doing our audit. But rather than to just to be able to wait, and let them go through the process and get it get it right. We had to go ahead and finish the audit, get it done by the June 30th. So that's where the new finding comes from. So when you look at this, there was one new finding this year and one dropped off. So we had a, a net zero change in the number of findings. But again, if you go back 10 years ago, there was you know, 15 findings and you go back five years before that and there were 25 findings. So well, been a, a, under why? Big improvement now, now. in the way that the town runs. <laughs> I just want to let you know, I was, I was here, you know, when I was here at least, uh, there's a huge improvement. So uh, that being said, I want to thank everyone, the town, uh, town commission, it's in our firm, and the town made it easy on us to do the you know, everything available to us online. Uh, and to get back to us as soon as we have any audit questions, there's a thousand of them. Okay. I'll stand if you have any questions for me. Do we have any questions at the table? I do have a comment. I appreciate it. There's been a couple of times I've reached out to you for some questions and you were right on the spot getting back and that means a lot. So thank you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I would love to see that though, that list of 14 Pierce cities. Okay, all right. right. Let me give you this. I'm sorry, Joseph, what were you asking? The 14 Pierce cities that he would go. Here, I'm just Pierce cities, okay. Yeah. I'm going to give you this. It's my. It's a. It's a more in, in depth of a financial a review that I do for my own self. Because as auditors, we're supposed to monitor your financial condition as well. We monitor it, and that's what I use. I got it. And if you wanted to copy that here, then I'll, I'll send that to. Please, yeah. Uh, okay, I'd like to see. Yeah, I like I'll to send it to everyone. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> well, that's all right. Um, the only question that I have is. It seems like our audit collides into our budget planning. And is there any way to change the timing of how we do this, pull it up earlier? Right. Yeah. Um, I've been just talking to Renee about that before I came up here. And they have the, there's a plan in place okay. to get the year closed quicker. And I'll, I'll tell you the way we do our audits is just we kind of just work with people when we're ready. You know, think that we can never really plan ahead because you never know what's going to happen, especially in this day of turnover. Finance director may leave, and then who we did the audit, the, the audit we did first one year, maybe the last in the next year. So as soon as the town is ready, and I mean ready, when, when you're ready for an audit, that means you're the books are done and you're subjecting us for you, not for us to do accounting 
you know, for us to do the audit. So it is, it is a really high level of preparedness ready for the audit. As soon as you are, we're going to, we would like to jump on it because we don't like getting it done in June. So we're going to work on us being ready, correct? Yes, <clears throat> for, for two things. So we did do a, a budget amendment. Um, we did cap for everything because there were some adjustments afterwards. And so we are already planning for the uh, budget amendment for this year so that we can, you know, make sure things are adjusted. Um, we have up to 60 days past the uh, end of the fiscal year. And I know Renee is working with our uh, consultant that we have mm -hmm. um, as far as getting everything ready uh, much earlier in the year so that we can, again, make sure we do a, a good job with the budget amendment as well as push. as well as having everything ready to, to get the audit started earlier. Because it, it does, these numbers are integral to what we're doing when we start doing our budget planning also. So um, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be behoove us to get this done earlier. Okay. Um, I need a motion on the table to accept the audit, and then we can take any comments from the audience that are there. I'll make a motion accepting the audit of uh, 2000. This is for September 20th, 2021. I'll second it. Thank you, everybody, for all the hard work you put into this because it's not easy. And, you know, we can just kind of spread the wealth out. That would be great. Um, we have any comments or questions from the audience. If you do have a comment or a question, please come to the podium and tell us who you are. Okay. Um, I'm going to bring it back to the table. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Well, thank you very much. And I do want to point out it's two years running. I haven't said city. I, I, yeah. Oh, no. uh, uh, you know, like, you should you should work that streak to the third one and like yeah, you should have waited. Yeah, I wasn't listening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Um we are to public forum. Public forum is an opportunity for people to speak about anything that is not already on the agenda. So if you wish to speak to us, we ask that you comment short and you come to the podium and tell us. Okay. Um, consent agenda. Do we have any questions or comments on the assent consent agenda? All right. I'll make a motion to accept consent agenda. All right. I'll second it. Moved and seconded. Any questions or any comments from the audience? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Second public hearing, ordinance 2022 16. Ordinance. Second public hearing, ordinance 2022 16, ordinance of the town of Oakland, Florida, changing the town's future land use plan map, designation of its comprehensive plan. From low density residential to commercial in the town of Oakland's comprehensive plan for certain real property owned by Ideal Builder 5 LLC, being Ridge County property appraiser, parcel number 27 000000 012, located at the following address 02 East Oakland Avenue, with an approximate size of 0.62 acres for these findings and providing for conflict, severability, and for the All right, who wants to talk about what this is about? Um, Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, again, my name is Brad. This is Blake Trim, and I'm a contracting town planner. And I just do a very short presentation overview. This is your second reading this evening for this, this item. Um, as was what you have before you is the second reading to change the land use from the residential land use to commercial land use on the property at 302 East Open Avenue. Uh, it's, about, it's about a little bit over 0.6 acres. Um, as you know, it's already developed as a single family home that is there. And what the intent is to convert that to a, 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 re, a broker, real estate broker's office. Um, the area around there has a mix of commercial land uses already in place on the future land use map, as well as the institutional, as well as residential. So it does fit in with that overall pattern. With that, I do want to just say it's in your staff report, but I do want to say it publicly as well, just so it is on the record, that we did have a code enforcement issue with this property about two weeks ago where they were doing work without a permit. It was resolved very quickly. I will say we did, once we found out about it, there was an inspection done, it was verified. I did talk to Ms. Lima, who is the representative, 
She then got with um, Ms. Gibbons, their planning and zoning, and everything has been resolved. And they understand they cannot do anything unless this gets approved. And then they go through all the proper permitting and reviews and approvals. So I do want the commission to know they did do what they needed to do to get that resolved quickly. We actually got it resolved within a day. It went very, very quickly. So I do want to just make sure that you are aware of that. Um, but in terms of that, other issues is, um, again, it's, it's consistent with the overall development in the area. As you know, the Planning and Zoning Board did review this. They did recommend approval of this request. And as we said at the last meeting, the staff, we also recommend approval. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, we went through this pretty um, thoroughly at our last meeting. Um, do we have any further questions at the table? Okay. Um, I need a motion on the table and then I'll be able to open it up to the audience. Make a motion to approve ordinance 2022-16. Second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Um, anyone who wishes to speak about this um, agenda item, please come forward. Let us know your name and try and keep your con comments brief. Reverend Reeves, we know who you are. Thank you. I just kind of want to say, who is that masked man? <laughs> I'm used to it over the past two years. Thank you, Mayor, for this opportunity and, and um, Commissioner each and every one of you guys. Hopefully, you can hear me real well. I'll do the best I can speaking through this mask. But I, I think if I share this little introduction, it, it would best describe my position for this evening. Uh, I realize that there's three kinds of people in the world. There are those who make things happen. There are those who watch things happen. And there are those who ask what happened. <laughs> I feel as though I've been all three. And with this particular project, I don't have enough information to you know, thoroughly give you a rebuttal against it because I don't know exactly what is gonna happen. I've been in the town of Oakland for years and years. You know, as I come off Star Creek, I make a right turn. I go up to a whole new development, beautiful homes are starting at half a million dollars. Wonderful, that's growth. But one thing they have that I don't think I have is that they have the assurance that at least they know what will be built next to them. You know, it's not like, oh, well, I'm wondering uh, they're going to change your, uh, there'll be a purple home or, or a small home. No, they know with assurance that whatever is built with them will be consistent with what they currently have. That I don't have anymore. I don't know. I don't know exactly what's coming. I don't know exactly how it's going to impact my home value. And if we leave this to the kids, my children, I don't know. So how can you, you know, debate something when you really don't know because I'm trying to project the future. How will this either positively or negatively impact my residents? And this particular property bucks up with our daycare and the church. <laughs> and I'm I'm right next to it. So if I turn to the left, don't going out in the driveway, I can see tractor supply. If I want anything, I can walk to it and pick up supplies. So now I feel as though that I'm getting into a position there where maybe I have a chance to make some decisions that might impact my future, my children, or am I being squeezed to a point where you're gonna to have to make a decision, right? What are you gonna do? Factory supply here, big lakeside church coming there, you know, which is okay. But now I have this commercial question. It could be something positive, but I don't know. The only thing I do know is that it's going to be, it won't be consistent with the current home situation. So I'm not here to rain on the Inland's Parade as a, as a town mayor, the commissioners. You guys have been very gracious to us as a church, as, as, as a daycare facility. There's things, and that's progress. And so my only biggest concern is that I don't want to be that third person. There's three kinds of people in the world. And I just don't know how this is going to impact me. And will I one day, will my, will my grandchildren or children inherit this home and they go, Dad, what happened? 
Is it commercial now? Do we pay commercial taxes in order to, to recoup something? The only thing I know is that, as I said, as I turn right on Oakland Avenue, those residents have something that I thought I had. And that was at least knowing whatever came next to me or whatever would be built next to me would be a home. It would be compatible. I don't have to know. So right now, I don't know. I don't know exactly how is this going to impact me. Will it force me to become commercial? I enjoy where I live. I love where I live. I have an actual backyard. You know, the dog can run. We can do that. They don't have that up there. I have that. I have space. I have, you know, mature oak trees. I love it. But how is this going to affect me? You know, I, I know that when the school was built, passerines were complied. When you needed a turn lane, <laughs> we're just complied. When you needed an easement for the water system, some property, we were complied. And we've just been giving and giving and giving. And that's all I'm saying is that do we have any input in the landscaping? Will there be a wall or something to divide this for? I just want to be sure that whatever they do, if I want to sell my property, it's not going to have a negative impact. So remember, there's only three kinds of people. And those who made things happen, those who watch things happen. And right now, I feel like the one who's going, what happened? happened? Um, well, I think we can answer a lot of your questions here, and um, I would turn it over to the Wade Trim gentleman, whose name I will learn one day. <laughs> right, Brad. Right. But I will say this before you move off, Joe, so we do recognize everything you have done to help us right. out as we've gone through it, and it's Absolutely. been phenomenal, so it is always appreciated. Yep, and I, I love your approach of you want to just understand and we all work together and, you know, we would never want to do anything that would impact your um, property negatively. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, yes, I think we, do, we have a lot that we can hopefully help with this concern. In my short time working with you all, I think one of the great tools that you have that will help his concerns is your design districts. That has, and this falls underneath that. So that will require the concern about the compatibility of how the building will be, you know, with the neighbors and things like that. That's governed by your design districts and the type of building it can be. It can't be a massive building. It's got to have the proper, you know, characteristics and architecture to fit in with the overall character of the town of Oakland. So it's not a, in other jurisdiction jurisdictions where it may be a blank slate if somebody you rezone piece of property and. You have no idea what that building is going to look like coming in next door to you. Here in the town of Oakland, you've got specific standards on how the buildings need to be, how the properties need to be developed. And I'm more than happy at any time with anybody to, to talk with, sit down with, go through those with them. Absolutely. So, um, and the part is too, the site is relatively small. That is, won't be able to handle a significant operation of anything, be able to, to fit on that property with the requirements would be for that to be developed out as a commercial fees. So I, I think you have those protections in and, and absolutely, you know, working now with your planner, I am always, always open for a phone call, an email, a text to, to talk to anybody at any point in time with questions or concerns about what's happening and what's going on. So we have um, uh, jurisdiction over what the color of this building is going to be, the size of this building. Um, planting is always something that we're very, very cognizant of. So protect um, the trees and, and the buffering to the residential around it. Absolutely. There's so much protection in place. I think that, Reverend Reeves, if you look at, I made this point in the last meeting, if you look at the building on Cross Street and Tub, or no, Cross Street and Oakland Avenue, that's kind of what this is going to be. Um, it's going to be a very small residential looking uh, office with a very small parking, very low impact. You couldn't even really, when we turn on, you know, Sal and I both live on Cross Street. So. And I was worried. Pardon? And I was worried. Yeah. It ended up a small footprint and it actually looks very nice compared to how it used to look. Right. It looks even better than it did. And it's 
very low impact to the surrounding um, residents. I live down the street, Sal lives down the street. Um, it really is, is not impactful at all. And that's what we're looking for with this. It's just gonna be a small office with a few parking spaces and a sign that is compliant with our um, restrictions. So it's going to be, it's gonna look like Oakland. Yes, ma'am. Would there be like uh, some type of privacy hit or wall or something that would? Yeah, we, we can absolutely work with that and have that as part of the requirements that comes through because we want to be sensitive to the interface with adjacent residential yes. properties where people live. We don't want to have that impact. So, so absolutely, that's something. But we have inputs. Absolutely. I mean, as I said, and I'll give you my heart, um, please, it, and it's almost, your town manager's okay with this, um, you know, please reach out to me. And Nancy lives. Yes, absolutely. Nancy lives close to it also. Next door. So, can you have her come up, please? And come on up. Can't hear them on the recording if they don't. Yeah, you can't hear me. Can't record me. So, it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's your story. You keep going. We wouldn't do that. We might do that. To us. <laughs> we wouldn't do that. To <laughs> um, so, I obviously I've met before six generation from Oakland. Besides me, the Postels, the Harps, and the Neds were the last of the original Oakland people. So I realized I agree with Pastor Reeves, everything he says, you know, the what, the watch, the see, the progress, that's great. But you gotta look at it. Where are you gonna go? Where are you gonna where are you gonna move to? My house is paid for. So where am I going to go? And so now you're going to add, in, in, in addition to the mean, hateful parents that come by every morning between 7.40 and 4, 4 o'clock that flip you the finger, throw trash in your yard, block your driveways, and call you Karen <laughs> because they won't let me in my driveway. Now you're going to add additional congestion to a small, very small area. Now, when I spoke with the individual a couple of weeks ago, the original person who was in the purchase of the corner of 302 um, Oakland Avenue, they were planning an auditorium. <laughs> like, where are you going to put that on a 0.6 acre lot with an already, what, 18, 1900 square foot house? So there's no room for that. There, and, you know, unless they're planning to, to plow back that their backyard, there's really no room for parking. And when you do, you're going to congest Star, Star Street. You just, all of a sudden there's just gonna be, and already I'm getting woken up at 521 in the morning with a garbage dump in my backyard from tractor supply. There's just no consideration whatsoever to those of us that live with obviously the growth of Oakland. I get it, but there's, there's got to be some kind of consideration for us. Oh, we, we are um, definitely telling you that it's going to be an office. It's going to have small amount of parking, okay. a little bit of travel. It's not going to be, you know, a busy kind of business, but it is a balancing act that um, we're trying to do, you know, because your property abuts up to commercial development and, you know, that's all that can go on Highway 50. I understand. And so, I mean, I sold my mother's five acres to the town of Oakland so that there could be a charter school and a private right. Okay. You gotta consider it. And so we're we're trying to be considerate of a compart of a, of a building that is going to be in a half residential house. And I mean, and you know, in all fairness, selling that five acres was I was able to keep my mother in her home till she died in her own bed. Right. I didn't have to put her into a nursing home. We loved Aunt Trina. <laughs> Aunt Trina. Aunt Trina. Woo. So, yeah, <laughs> she was, <laughs> but in a good way. So, yeah, yeah, she was, a, she was a good mom. She was Hitler growing up, but she was, <laughs> she was sweet in her older age. So, but anyway, 
she would she would be I don't know what she would be right now seeing what's going on you know I think she'd be mixed and she'd be happy that there is growth you know growing up I raised with 535 people in town of Oakland I know you know if you weren't my uncle cousin or grandparent <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was, uh, you know, I was at the Presbyterian Church this weekend with a Ross, who's very pleased with how things have gone here. So, you know, it just, it's, 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 it's hard. Oh, sure it is. Absolutely. You know, so, I, I get it, you know, I, I totally, I totally understand and I appreciate it from all areas, but you have to understand where the preacher and I come, we're getting squeezed out and we're at the age that, you know, where do you go? Do you go to the bed? They put me down? <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that this particular, this uh, particular uh, piece of... Um, <laughs> uh, I believe she called you guys old back there. <laughs> I really don't think that this is going to be nearly as impactful as any as other things could be and well, can we do anything about the garbage being dumped at five o'clock in the morning that's a whole, that's other, a whole subject other that issue, we yes. should address i mean that's just absurd you know that's 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 you know, I can save your life or I can kill you. It depends on the number of hours I have. I got to sleep. I know there's a clean line. You've got a good point for us to consider with the tractors. Yeah, like we will. We'll look in. And I work for a plastic surgeon, so you don't have any problems. Okay. <laughs> I think that's uh, a compliment. Yeah. We got you. We got you. We understand. And we'll work on the garbage thing. We, we, it's just it's just the people need, we appreciate the growth, but people need to be considerate of those that are already there. Right. It's, it's basically bottom line of, of the whole thing. And we're trying to do that with this piece of um, the agenda. We really are. It's going to be a small you know, office with Again, very little traffic. Run, it could highly benefit me and us to reach. Yeah, and we'll look at buffering. So it's just in the meantime, if we could keep the idiots at bay. <laughs> let us know how that. <laughs> so we've been trying hard on that. Figure out how to do that. Let us know. Poker ball. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're done. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Quick question. Yes. Listening to you and hearing what they said, it sounds like you've really already decided. Is that correct? Well, this is the second reading. Um, we went through this in the last meeting at two in my in detail. Okay. So simple. Have you already decided what is going there? I can't okay. speak for anybody but myself. Has, uh, so it has not been voted on. No. It's been voted on once. It gets voted on twice. Okay. And that's tonight. Yes. Okay. I was just trying to help you. I, I'm not living anywhere close to you, but I appreciate what you're doing. All right, do we have anybody else? All right, and I will, you know, never mind. I'm not even going to go there. Brad. Yes, sir. So you understand the neighbors? Absolutely. You understand what? You need to do to make this place look, look up like there. part of the neighborhood, not be in the neighborhood. Small. And I can the commission and the mayor know we've already had a discussion with the applicant and with the owners. Um, we have they they are not doing anything. Hey, folks, we folks said they yeah. thought they were going to. They hang have, on, hang on, stop, um, stop, right, right, yes, ma'am, stop. Folks, could you please one conversation at a time and listen to what he has to say? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we, we have already communicated that to the applicant and the owner to tell them how critical and important it is to do things that's completely consistent and compliant with the town and its character and its protection of its residents. So you yeah, absolutely, and, and they, they, they are aware of that. They are not going to, they, and I just to address the, the first issue of the uh, 
mm -hmm. event center. That's not happening. That is not at all on the table at all. So okay. we don't have, as you said, Mayor, can't, will not happen, cannot happen. Is, and as anything that will happen will be fully consistent in compliance with the town. Is Mike Morrissey part of the yes, sir. makeover? Yeah, what, and, what, and actually, in what your code also requires, this commercial development, it'll have to go in front of your appearance review board as well. Yes. So there's a lot of oversight. ARB board. board. Yes. yes, your ARB, to make Thank sure you. it does do this, what you said, sir. So um, just for those folks who are here for whatever issue you're here for, um, we have an appearance review board that looks at these things. Mm -hmm. We have a planning and zoning board that looks at these things. We have a designer who approves what is going in here so that it, that it looks and feels like the town of Oakland. And then it comes to us. So there's a lot of steps along the way at, that we put in place to make sure that things are done and keep the fabric of our community the way it is. So. Uh, you know, just so you know, that it doesn't just come to us and we go, okay, it's it's got a lot of approval hoops and a lot of things that are put in place to keep things looking in right for the town. So from a property fan point, from neighbors or being a neighbor to, I worry what you worry, Joe, uh, Pastor and 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 your neighbor? Nancy. Nancy. I worry about that. So I know that having Mike Morrissey and all the team, all the, all the filters that we have, we're going to have something that we're all going to be proud of that's going to bring up your property values in the end and privacy. So I'll, I want to be vigilant about it. You guys want to be vigilant about it. So just want to make sure that those are the steps. And I would and please make sure that folks have your card. So that absolutely. Will. The whole thing. What I will do as well. And talk to you individually. The process starts when they submit to the um, I will absolutely reach out to them as the neighbors, let them know if they would like to get the plans, we can send them to them because it's all open. I want everybody to be transparent to see what's happening. So do we. What we're reviewing and, and get the site the improvements, 100%. parking, everything. So it's going to be improved. Okay. Absolutely. I just want to add if anyone has any concern, if you go to the minutes of the last meeting, you will see how all of us run around the room and kind of went. At, not went after, but talk to them, ask them so many different questions, because we're all concerned that when we do something like this, we need to make sure. God even asked the question, what was the reason why someone wanted to vote against it? So we always want to know what the residents want. So we would never um, 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 just take them off, because we will always ask, how does that impact those right around that area? But if you go to the notes, if you go to the website, you see the notes from last time, you'll see all the questions that were asked of, that, of the applicant. And the word auditorium, I remember this vividly, it was a, a language, how they say it in Portuguese or whatever compared to America. So that's what the auditorium thing, that's what threw it out, what made it sound like it was an auditorium, but it really wasn't. So, but please look at the notes, you know, we would never, I mean, you know, Pastor Reeves, I know you guys very well, we would never do anything that's gonna make anyone feel uncomfortable. Yeah, because I was gonna ask, what, I, I always ask, we all ask, what does the residents of right around the area say about that private? And just and then as an FYI, as Joseph was pointing out, um, the first reading is where we really tear it apart. Um, and then when the second reading comes back, any changes that need to be made and um, further concerns are addressed. But we really, really um, dive deep in the first reading. Okay. Any other questions? Any other comments? Okay, I'm going to close public hearing and bring it back to the table. Um, do we have any further comments at the table? Okay, all in favor? Uh, okay. We're going to make a motion. Did we make a motion? We had a motion. You did not Rick? Put it on the table? A motion. Okay, good. Sorry about that. <laughs> Again? <laughs> all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Second public hearing ordinance dash 22 dash 17. And we'll please make sure that you reach out and get a business card so that you can continue to follow this project as we go along. 
So this is second public hearing for ordinance number 2022-17 and ordinance of the town of Oakland, Florida, amending the town's official zoning map designation from R1A single family residential to C1 commercial for certain real property owned by Ideal Builder 5 LLC bearing property tax parcel identification number 21-22-27-0000. Dash zero zero dash zero one two and making findings and providing for conflict severability and for an effective. Uh, Mayor and commissioners, now this is the second half of this same property, 302 East Open Avenue. What this is now doing is assigning the proper zoning district to match the future land use, um, land use you just approved for that property for commercial. Everything we spoke about in the previous case applies to this case as well. Um, this now just finishes out the process to get it to the point where now things can move forward. But again, all the protections that we talked about will be applied. Be happy to answer your questions, Janet. Any questions no. at the table? All right, I need a motion, please. I'll make the motion, except the second public hearing of ordinance 2022-17. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. I'm gonna open a public hearing. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I'm going to close the public hearing, bring it back to the table. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So now we're moving on to resolution 22, 2022-06. All right, I'll take this one. So uh, back on February 22nd of 2022, uh, ordinance 2021-28, 28 was um, enacted, imposing a temporary moratorium on the acceptance and processing of new applications for special exception uses, zonings, comp plan amendments, and any other development applications or, or plans proposing to increase multifamily entitlements within the town. Um, so we've gone through the, the six months, and that will end on August 22nd. We've still a few more steps we'd like to go through uh, before we lift the moratorium. I'm working with uh, with Mike Morrissey and with with Fred. Um, now that he's on board, we are putting together um, some information to bring back to talk about our design districts and how they apply to multifamily and mixed use developments out on Highway 50. And then I want to have a, an additional uh, discussion with both PNZ and the Commission uh, concerning are there any changes to <laughs> so hopefully during the next six months we can get through those two parts of the process. Uh, we've already had meetings on March 15th with a, a joint planning meeting of the PNZ and ARB. On April 19th, we had a public workshop with planning and zoning. And on April 26th, we had a public meeting with the town commission. So we've got some information already that's been put together. Um, we're gonna go through and actually talk about some renderings and some putting the design districts into uh, visually so that you can see how they would apply to these these areas on 50 and then make some recommendations on, on things that might be changed in the code. So in order to work on those, we need to extend this for city. So the recommendation is to approve resolution 2022-06, extending the multifamily work for 180 days. It can be shortened by resolution if we were to get done with this quicker. Um, we'll just have to see how the, the timeline works. These things take a little bit of time to go through that process. If you have any questions, also Stephanie's here. Um, as far as you know, the legal processes we've got. Okay, so um, to translate that for folks, um, <laughs> what we are doing is extending the moratorium on multifamily HS apartments in the town of Oakland until we feel like we have a good handle on what's coming at us and how we would do that. Yes. Respond to that. So um, that's another good six months of um, no more, you know, we're not taking any applications. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So any questions at the table? All right, I need a motion, please. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 2022-06 to extend the moratorium for 180 days. I'll second it. Okay, it's moved and seconded. Does anybody in the audience have any questions or comments? Okay, bring it back to the table. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, now we're moving on to Florida um, League of Cities Health Insurance Presentation and Coverage Agreement. 
All right, I'll introduce uh, Lindsay Parsons. Um, she's with uh, Port of League of Cities and the Port of Municipal Insurance Trust. We have gotten some information on our health insurance plan um, with some major increases in our plan costs. We are looking at some different options, and the option I'd like to recommend is moving to the Port of League of Cities. So, uh, Lindsay will go through her presentation. Good evening, Council uh, Mayor and Council members. Uh, it's uh, nice to be here and thank you for having me tonight. Uh, again, my name is Lindsay Larson. I'm with the Florida League of Cities and I am the Group Health Account Executive on behalf of the Florida Municipal Insurance Trust. So um, with that being said, I want to uh, commend your city manager and your HR director um, on going out, doing their due diligence, on trying to find what is going to be best for this city. Uh, and, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> you know better, right? I go with go with all of them. You should feel honored. It took her the second one to get. <laughs> I must have been sleeping on the <laughs> uh, So again, um, we are just going to go over kind of what the FMIT is a little bit, uh, a little bit of background of it, and then dive into the plans on what we think would be best for your uh, town staff. All right, so the Florida Municipal Insurance Trust, it is a non-accessible pooled risk uh, arrangement, meaning there aren't going to be any surprises. So when we come in with your premium, it is going to be just that. There are no extra costs. We aren't, throughout the year, we're not gonna be like, oh, well, you know, you had a larger claim, we need to charge you more money. We're not gonna do that. So you are fully insured uh, coming into the trust. And you have a full run out claim, meaning if the town ever decided, okay, we want to go somewhere else, you are not going to be stuck with an extra charge at the end to pay out the rest of those claims. So the trust is going to assume all risk and pay those claims out if for whatever reason the, the town wanted to leave. Uh, by coming into the FMIT, you do have the pooled buying power. So currently you guys are kind of standalone the town of Cleveland. if a large claim hits your book you're going to see the price increase which is kind of what happened there were a few large claims that hit the book uh you'll see when we go over the price comparison uh kind of where that happens well in the pool and in the trust you're not just the town of Oakland but you are all uh members combined so our trust is consisted of 95 members across the state of Florida with, I like to call them belly buttons because we call our members our municipalities. And then we have 3,700 belly buttons for employees. And then adding the dependents onto that, we have over 7,000 belly buttons in our trucks. So now you're going from a town of 100 employees to now a giant pool of, okay, if a large claim hits your book, we're gonna share that across the pool the town isn't going to be stuck trying to uh, pay that claim. We are a direct writer. So currently you guys go through a broker. We don't work with brokers. You will work directly with the Florida League of Cities and the FMIT. So what does that mean for you guys? There's no broker commission. You're not paying me extra money or a flat rate to come out here and, and run our program. I am an employee of the Florida League of Cities, not the trust. So there is no extra cost. Again, your premium is just that. So there's no extra broker fee, no extra line items for us to do our work that we have to do here. So again, more savings to the town. There we go. Okay, so what does our program consist of? Uh, we do use the United Healthcare Administrative Services. So what does that mean? We use the United Healthcare Network. The reason we choose to work with United Healthcare, it is the largest network in the nation. So uh, another benefit coming to your staff is not only will they have all in-network benefits, but out-of-network benefits. So it's not just the state of Florida. So if you were in, on vacation in Colorado 
and you got sick and needed to go to an urgent care, you can find a network doctor there and you do in network benefit. If you, you do not need a referral to see any PCP or a specialist. So if you needed to go in and see a cardiologist, you can go directly to the nice. doctor. Yes, yeah, so there is no referral needed. Again, you have the pooled access to national network provider discounts. So this is huge for you guys. Because again, town of Oakland is now being recognized as a as basically a 3,500 person group instead of just the town of Oakland. So when it comes to discounting, when we go to hospitals or we go to providers, you're going to get the best discount that United has. Uh, of course, it's going to lessen the impact of claims. So again, when you hit a large claim, it's going to be across the pool, it's not going to be just on the town of Oakland. So there is that sharing power of claims throughout the trust. And then of course, our bread and butter being the Florida League of Cities and the Florida Municipal Insurance Trust is the municipality in mind. Again, being the Florida League of Cities, we are your association. So we wanna do what's going to be best for your employees. There we go. Okay. So what really sets us apart, all of these uh, services that I am going to go over are free to the, the town. So if you become a member of the Florida Municipal Insurance Trust under our group health program, the city is going to have free access to an EAP program or an employee assistance program. So that is unlimited calls into our EAP program, along with three free in-person visits per issue per year. So again, that's at no extra cost to the city or their employees. We have a hometown health advantage program, which is a critical care management unit, which this takes people that are like with diabetes, high blood pressure, if you went into a hospital um, and had a heart attack or you were diagnosed with cancer, this critical care management unit is going to walk you through everything and set you up with all your doctor's appointments, make sure you're getting all your medicines that you need and kind of get you on track, especially if it's a catastrophic event that obviously you weren't planning on having, right? It will walk you through that. Uh, the reason we put this in is because we saw such a great ROI on this program and really bringing those people like your diabetics and people with high blood pressure, making sure they are getting the care to either reverse the issue, meaning again, bringing that premium down, right? Because you're having less costs come in, less claims come in. So the reason we put that in is to just better your employees, again, at no cost to the town. We have virtual doctor appointments. Uh, you, you will see we are offering two different plans on plan four, your PPO uh, plan. The virtual doctor visits cost $0. So there is no copay to use that, which again is fantastic, especially going through a pandemic. I don't know if we'll ever be out of the pandemic, but it's great. Um, so again, that's basically acute care, getting that done at $0. Know your benefit trainings. So, of course, if the town decides to move to FMIT, it would be a big move. You're going from Florida Blue or Blue Cross Blue Shield to United Healthcare. So, we come in and we educate all of your employees. We will do department to department meetings. We bring in United Healthcare reps that come and speak with myself. And then also, our wellness team comes in and talks with your employees too. We do this at open enrollment time. And then again, come in January, we really dive deep in the plan to make sure that your employees are being smart consumers of the plan and aren't running to the ER because they have strep throat. Because right, the ER is gonna cost more on the back end, increasing that premium, where if they could have done a virtual doctor visit for free, it's costing everyone less money. So, um, we really take pride in that and we come out and the great thing is, is we are local to you. Our office is 20 minutes 
uh, east so we can be here whenever the town needs. And then our the thing we pride ourselves most in is the employee wellness program. This is a huge benefit to the town. It is free to the town and their employees. It is a robust turnkey program for wellness, employee wellness, which we come in and we run the entire program for you. We pay for all the incentives to get your employees on the right track, kind of turning your culture around to be healthy, um, catching those catastrophic events before they happen. We come on site and we do biometric screenings right here for your employees because if this, I mean, I don't, this is shocking, but uh, the number one group of, or of uh, people that don't go to doctor are municipal employees. So meaning those catastrophic events, those heart attacks, those strokes, they're not being caught until that happens. So that's why we like to come in. Let's get them on the preventative medicine before that takes place. Again, this is just going to help all around um, bring the culture of the town better, make them more healthy, bring down that premium, really tackle those large claims. Like, let's get them in network, first of all, into in network doctors. And then, secondly, really turning around their uh, medical usage of the plan. Again, we, we fund all of that. We give incentives. We fund all of that. We do challenges throughout the year. So it is a very robust program that the town currently does not have. All right, so let's get into the nitty gritty, right? The, let, how much money am, am I saving? That's what we want in here, right? All right, so your rates are set for the entire policy year. Again, if you said, mm, come January, no, it's not working. We just need a 45 day notice. So for whatever reason, if it didn't work out, that is all we need. There is no run off claim. Again, no commission is paid to me or to the trust. And then the premium dollars directly support FLC efforts to your municipality. So when you guys are up fighting up uh, during legislative session, those are what is really helping. So these premium dollars go back to help your, your league efforts. So if we refer to this uh, big spreadsheet that I have right here, this is going to compare your current cost and what your renewal cost came in with Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield compared to our United Healthcare plan. So we took our plan four and compared it to your plan 3769. And our renewal rate came in at 14%, where your renewal rate with your current came in at 32.33%. So that is a savings with FMIT of $133,000. Um, again, these rates are kind of based off of how the group is running. Um, and then, of course, demographics. And if we haven't all heard this enough, but inflation and medical rate is also built into that as well. The good thing about this is your rates went, are, aren't coming in as high, and your staff are getting better benefits with Plan 4. Most of your staff are on uh, this plan. There are 62 employees on this plan. Um, so I think they will be very happy to find out that uh, some of their co-pays are going down. Uh, the, the rate is going to be cheaper than what it would be if uh, they stayed with their current. Their out-of-pocket is coming down. So benefits are definitely uh, increased on this plan with a lower cost of what renewal would come in. If we go to the next plan, plan 05302 with Blue Cross Blue Shield compared to our plan six, uh, we came, so your current renewal came in at 37.82% and the FMIT came in at 19.04%. So again, a savings to the town of $26,000 $35.08. Again, this plan, your deductible is going to still be lower and your out-of-pocket max is going to be lower. So again, the benefit is 
still coming in better than what your current plan is. Um, and again, add a savings uh, to the town if they were to stick with their renewal from their current broker. So with that, are there any questions? Um, no, I defer to Joseph with any questions that he might have. No, no, this is something we've been trying to do for a long time. It has been hard for the town to switch. Yeah. yeah. More power in numbers. Yeah, yeah. I know Steve's been working on it for a long time. Trying to find the right time to make a switch. Well, you know more about this than we do. Yeah. So I tell Jenny when I see her tomorrow that we, we're going to switch. But it's, it's, it's great. Plus, they give back premiums to the, to the local leagues. The more people are involved with it, money comes back to the local leagues, too, to do other programs. So it's a win-win all the way around. Okay. That's a great point. So, yeah, if, if you are enrolled in anything with the FMIT, a stipend does go back to your regional league. So that's a great point as well. So, so just under full disclosure, we did get some additional um, from our current broker, some additional stuff today. Um, that's slightly lower than this, but it also has the, the plan design isn't as good as what the plan designs are here. Um, I see a lot of um, positive that we uh, are getting from moving to the League of Cities, both from how close they are to the extra benefits that they have and being in the larger pool instead of being in a pool on our own. So even with slightly, the rates are slightly lower than what you're seeing here for the the uh, what what they're offering with United, I, I it, again the plan design's got some differences to it that aren't as good as these plan well, designs. You know, I think about um, strength in numbers, and I also think about no profit. Okay. You know, who we're using now, they're making a profit, and do we really want to plow that money back to our? But place? I see a lot of utility being in a bigger pool um, as we move forward um, with the town. So. Yeah, and I think this this covers it. And we're going to go from three plans to two, and these are the two plans that we're going to move forward. All I need is is an approval um, uh, from the commission, basically, to uh, allow me to sign the coverage agreement with the Florida Municipal Insurance Trust. And if Joseph, you know, is more the expert than any of us at the table, elected officials, you know, I I do appreciate your input. These health programs pay for it. I mean. The extra health programs, I mean, that's, you, you can't, you can't get that outside at these rates here. So this, you know, you know, and I, the parts about people coming out and, and talking to the, to the staff and getting them involved with these health programs, yep. that's, that's priceless. Yeah. So, and, and, and that's a big piece. That's a big piece. So we're already setting up meetings for next week yeah. uh, with the department heads and the different departments to start getting this information out to the, to the employees. So. Um, and I know they've already had some questions about doctors being in the network mm -hmm. and stuff. And I think we've been able to answer most of those questions. Yep, so they've far. all been in the network. Yeah, yeah I've heard, I, what you told me was that, you know, it was minuscule, the amount of doctors. Yeah, so far, we have, I think there were only a couple that might have not been in the network. But um, we're, we're definitely uh, trying to be responsive to the, to the uh, employees and making sure. Um, so um, with that, I, I, and we've had, things have been good with the Florida League of Cities since we moved our uh, retirement over to them also. Awesome. Very responsive and uh, Rodney's been great. So uh, uh, the, the service has been good with, with the League of Cities. Yeah, the Florida League of Cities is the top League of Cities in the country. Of the 49 League of Cities, Florida, Florida League of Cities is the top. Good. I mean, they, they do a very good job. Yeah, so all that they're managing, you know, and they work with counties too. So they doesn't work with Cities and towns and villages, they work with counties too. So they have several counties um, that's part of their network. Good. Anybody else have any questions at the table? Yeah. All right, now. All right. Um, I'll take a motion. Please. You want a motion, right? Yeah. I just I need the authority to uh, to sign the coverage agreement with the FMIT. Okay. okay. So I need a motion, please. I'll make a motion to approve. The town manager signed an agreement with FLC um, uh, MIT um, Insurance. I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any questions or comments from the audience? Okay, bring it back to the table. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. I think this is a good thing for our employers. Excellent. Excellent.
Fine. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> okay, other policy matters. Bayview at Johns Lake. I think uh, there are a lot of people here who want to hear about it. Brad's going to go first, and then the applicant also has a presentation. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, again, Brad, Brad, hold on just a second with some people. Uh, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, night. Are you going to get donuts? <laughs> Okie dokie. Right. And now your name is Brad. I'm Brad. Brad, I'm serving as your contact with town planner. Um, as we said, what we have before you this evening is the preliminary subdivision plan for the proposed Bayview at Johns Lake uh, subdivision. Uh, I have a short presentation. Um, also, as we go through this, if there's questions, given there's a history to the project before I came on board, I will ask Mr. Coons to help me as well, as well as Mr. Parker, with any questions you all may have about Oops. So the project, the location, um, as you all know, is at the end of Remington Road, at the very south end there. And that's where the star is on. That's the location. There we go. So as you all may be aware, in your process, you have three steps in your process for development, uh, subdivision development such as this. This is in the first step, as you see here. This is the very first step, it's the preliminary subdivision plan. So as you can see, there's still quite a bit more work to go before they can actually start doing anything. Um, after this, they'd have to come back to the town to present their civil and construction plans, and then that would then come back to you all when they want to go through the final plat. So there is quite a bit more work to go after this process, just to make that clear. And this shows the location of the site, the highlighted in the orange there. Um, the Bayview at Johns Lake. The applicant is venue development. Um, that property is about seven acres, and it's a vacant piece of property. Um, and what the proposal is to develop 20 single family lots on that piece of property. Um, this property has a zoning of R1A. What's a little bit different from what you would typically see here, this is not coming through as a planned unit development. This is coming through as just straight zoning on the property because this project is compliant with the straight zoning without it. So what that does mean, and we'll get into that more here just in a moment, is your standards, your, your standard zoning requirements, design requirements apply to this property. There aren't where you're approving a development agreement that would give them you know, specific standards that would only apply to them that may be different or alternative. Here they're at, they will be subject to your standard requirements of your zoning and your design and your engineering standards. So that is an important thing that's a um, state here this evening so, um, with this project. Um, just real quickly, that is just a quick snapshot of what the plan, it's, it's 20 lots with an internal roadway. Um, and in the stormwater, the lots range from 68 to 80 feet wide with those 80 foot lots there along the lake on the south side of the project. Um, it does abut up to John's Landing there on the uh, north and east side of the project and Remington Road is, their drive is on the uh, west side of the project. That's a quick little layout of the project. Um, one of the important things that has happened over the last month or so is this development of a memorandum of understanding. As part of the subdivision, there is infrastructure that'll have to be put in place and improvements to existing roads and, and things like that. Um, what has occurred is uh, Mr. Parker, your public work director, uh, your town manager has negotiated a memorandum of understanding with the applicant to provide for their responsibilities at their cost, no cost to the town for sort of certain improvements related to the subdivision and, and their potential impact. So I'll hit these very quickly. Um, they are going to, they have to provide for a 24 foot wide access into the project off of Remington. Um, they will also be dedicating a lift station track and lift station to the town. Um, they will have, with their connection to the town's water system, they'll put in the water system for their project and then they'll connect to two points to the town system to create the loop system that's very beneficial for utilities. They will be doing that. They're also required to do all construction related to connecting to the town's um, sewer system. They will make those as well as providing the lift station. 
Um, in terms of sidewalks, they will have internal to the project, five foot sidewalks internal to the project and external to the project. They will have six foot sidewalks on the east side of Remington Road. Um, and then related to Remington Road, there's also, they will be doing a reconstruction of the eastern side of Remington Road from Gloriana, about 140 feet north, because there's a bit of a misalignment in that area to correct that misalignment. So they will also be doing that part of the requirements. Um, also, the, as part of the plat process, which is a standard requirement, they will have to provide the town a financial guarantee to assure that all the infrastructure beyond even what's on this list that's put in is put in as required and is maintained properly for at least three years. So that will also be part of the requirement. And also an important part of this memorandum of understanding it does also say that the developer will get no impact fee credits for any of this work. So they will still be paying all full impact fees in addition to the maintenance that is part of this MOU. Um, it's in your packet. The applicant has already signed the MOU. So one of the requests to the uh, town commission this evening would be to authorize your town manager to sign the MOU on the town's behalf, if, if you so desire for him to do that. So that's it. So this project, it did go to your planning and zoning board in July. There was quite a bit of conversation and discussion with their zoning board, um, but they did recommend the approval of this preliminary subdivision plan. They did have two concerns. Um, one is the infrastructure improvements, and it's basically the items I just reviewed as part of the MOU. So what has occurred since that meeting, the memorandum of understanding has been developed and been signed by the applicants so that concern of the planning and zoning board um, has been addressed. And they also did made a concern about you know, better development of the landscape plan as well as buffering to the, the neighboring development of, of John's Landing. So those are the concerns, but they did have an approval to the town commission of this preliminary subdivision plan. So what happened after that? So after the planning and zoning board meeting, um, the applicant did submit revised plans based on comments that were received from the planning and zoning board. Um, we did receive them to the town on August 4th for those. And we did also send those out to Mike Morrissey, your design consultant, because he was part of the process earlier on in the process to make sure his concerns or comments were being addressed. Um, we did receive comments back from Mr. Morris, Morrissey that he did not, his comments were not fully addressed. And he did raise some concerns and his concerns related to similar things that we have with the planning and zoning. It was uh, with the landscape, the tree protection replacement, as well as the, the buffer um, with John's Landing. So those are some concern, those concerns that he raised. We did forward those concerns to the applicant um, to make them aware of that. And the applicant has now prepared a presentation for you this evening, which I believe will talk about some of those issues. Um, let me back up real quick. Mr. Morris was also concerned um, that the architecture of the homes have not been approved yet. So he doesn't want uh, the town committed. What you'll see this evening are the actual architecture with the homes will be. Again, they are subject to your standard design requirements within your town because it's a straight zoning. And Mr. Morrison did not approve those designs yet for this project. Um, he also raised a few concerns about some conceptual plans that we've seen that I believe will be in the presentation of the um, the lot layouts for the homes and how those are laid out, and that may need to be adjusted. So those are some concerns that Mr. Morrissey had. Uh, one of the things just I want to say to the town commission this evening is uh, from your staff perspective, um, those issues will be worked out as we go through those next steps through the construction um, plan review. Part of that, there's also more engineering that needs to occur. The engineering is only partly done at this point because it is a preliminary plan, so it's not a problem that's it still needs to be flushed out further. So this will go through further review. And as it goes through that further review, if issues occur that push it out of what you all are, have approved generally and outside of your code requirements and your design standard requirements, it's gonna have to come back to you all with that. It has to be compliant with your code. If it's not, it has to come back to you all. Um, to consider that change. 
So we do want to make that clear to you all this evening um, moving forward. We also just want to say, you know, some of the information they will show you tonight, we don't want, again, it's up to you all as the board to decide this or not, but we don't think you should accept that as you're approving the, the house images they may show you or the buffering issues because we need to, those haven't been reviewed, those haven't been approved yet by your staff. We need to still work through that to make sure it's fully compliant and we will do that to assure that that occurs. Um, but I did want to make that's an important point. But but I do believe it will be able to meet our code work with that and go through, through it. Um, so what oops, I'm sorry. What our recommendation is um, is basically what I said again is uh, the site plan in the building and the buffering and all those pieces, what we're asking you as part of your condition that you are recognizing that it still needs to go forward through the formal you know, constructive design process. If there's a problem, not a compliance, it will definitely come back to you all as the town commission. Um, we're also asking as part of this approval that, and, and the applicant is aware of this, these conditions, is that when they move forward with development of the lots, they will go through your standard design process, including the design review by Morrissey, as well as your appearance review board. So that, that process will be in place for this project as it gets built out um, um, for the property. And the last point, again, just reiterating, I think this I had some few times, so I thought it was very important, is that you know we as a staff we can't authorize any variances or deviations or differences to what your code requires them to do. So anything that would trigger that will have to come back and, and get the proper review by most likely your planning and zoning board as well as you all as the town commission. So that so we do recommend approval with those understandings, those recommendations. Um, if you do approve this this evening, then the next step would be we would then go out, you know, have the developer come back in with his instruction. Uh, we all we are fully aware of the concerns of the Johns um, neighborhood adjacent here, and as I said earlier, I also have that commitment to this as well: is to work with them together with the developer to come up with a solution that not only meets your code, but most likely will go beyond what your code requires to to get a win-win solution for both sides of the town. So we, we are aware of that, and that will be part of as this moves forward. So that is my short presentation. Um, any questions at this point? I'll do my best to answer them. If I can't, ask the town manager to help me. Any questions at the table? Got a question. I'm a, they got three lakefront lots here, and I'm looking at the, uh, the pretty pictures here. Yes, and I see um, houses on each side there. Can you tell me what the width of those lots are? And the three on the lot on the, 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 on the two, lake. the two on the, the next to it. Just under, I know, my computer guys. I um, mean, I'll have the applicant confirm this for me. One is um, just, they're both just under 80 feet. I think one is 79 or almost under. He's asking about each side. On I'm, the yeah, side. I'm talking about just outside the development. Oh, outside the development. Yeah. Okay. So, so see. Yeah. I don't believe I have that. But see one to the left and see one to the right. For the existing. This house. Yes, sir. And this house. Do we have this picture to put up on the board? Which one are you, look, no, are you looking at? Looking at the. Uh, 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 all of that. They're going to make that presentation now. Right. And let them go through their presentation. And we can ask somebody. Okay. Okay. Listen to them. So I'll answer it when I'm allowed. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor, Council. Um, we'll wait for the presentation. My name is Andrew Ruthie. I'm a Castle Co. Uh, applicant and representing the concept. This is a there you go. So as we get that ready, I wanted to present a, a few more pretty pictures, if I may, and, and just uh, so, somewhat redundant to uh, what Brad just did. And since it's getting close to my bedtime, time, I'm going to go through it quickly. As I'm, I'm with your brother. <laughs> it's uh, maybe with John's like a boutique residential. 20 lots, uh, 17 interior, three on the road. Uh, so, um, 
just some, some pretty pictures that you guys are obviously aware of. A lot from the aerial development. Beautiful part. Our, our development team consisting of uh, Steve Allen and Edwin Guerrero, uh, civil engineers, um, innovations design group, uh, Matthew McFadden and Richard Real uh, myself, and uh, Tina Lee is the director of land islands at uh, Ashton Woods. So um, some of the, a little bit more drilled down points, uh, we did petition uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service for uh, technical guidance with regard to presence of skinks and scrub bays, none do uh, uh, basically plan to do the gopher tortoise uh, uh, survey a little later on because it only has a 90 day shelf life. So that is uh, basically going to be done. The geotech report does just very strongly uh, uh, support the, the plan development. So this all conditions are. We don't anticipate any issues there. As was stated before, we are going to bring in and connect to the sewer main, um, and both water and sewer will be, uh, will be uh, brought into the subdivision at our expense. More detailed there in terms of. Um, but there are the lots and the configuration of the lots, the sizes of the lots, um, all of which. Is See there are charts of a lot of shows. The this is a very preliminary footprint of the of a product that Ashton Woods uh, plans to use. It's the same product. They're backloaded garages, as you can see. It's kind of small, but um, you can see them in your in your handouts. Um, but again, we we do introduce Ashton Woods as the as the builder uh, of this type of vision. Um, and your pamphlets as well as is some more details of the product that's being planned. And the and and the good thing here is that they were very adamant about using this product and making sure it fits because it is the Ashton Woods product that is currently being reviewed by Mr. Morrison uh, at uh, for their barley farm project. So the, the very product that's going in here is going is being reviewed from the design standards uh, standpoint um, currently by by Morrissey. So it's kind of a a, a real win win in terms of product and product use. The um, landscape cross section. We wanted to give you a sense of what landscape is going to look like in in in, in this. Uh, Subdivision. You could see some of the specifics in terms of the types and species that we're planning. Uh, and this is just a cross section as you come into the community and make that first bite into that length of homes. Compare to a quick little video that just gives you a sense of, of what the landscape is like. Some, some of these trees, I'm not sure if the of purity, et cetera, is intact, but, but should be pretty pretty close. The folks that developed this video did so uh, from the landscape plan. And that is entering the community uh, and then making the right into the stretch of homes. Again, all product that is uh, Currently under review for from the design standard standpoint. Looks like a lot of cracks in the asphalt. <laughs> 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 Very realistic, right? But I, I, I thought I would do uh, that with you so that you can see some of the. This is the MOU that um, Brad already went through. I, I don't need to reiterate the section. This might be helpful in terms of, of a little bit more detail on, on the straightening at uh, Remington Road all the way to Gloriana. 
going to be doing as as a grade. Um, a concern was brought forth uh, to uh, state coats uh, by the John, John's Landing HOA representative after the recent PTC hearing held on July July nineteenth. Uh, primarily regarding, from what we understood, a privacy issue at the northern border of the Bayview properties in Buttstone and in way the entrance to their community. We were informed immediately that that fellow uh, did not speak at the hearings so and didn't know about it until I got the call from Steve. But once we did, um, I had an exchange with him, a uh, quick conversation, and we, we basically had. Uh, um, an understanding of what primarily we needed to to address, and and uh, through that um, we we did discover a early comment from Mike Morsey that occurred in in a pre application that our team had missed. Um, so based on the conversation with the member from the HOA uh, and uh, that discovery, we did change the landscape plan. And uh, I'll show you some, some um, details on, on, on that plan as regards that northern plan. So this was the actual comment from, from Morrison with regard to the northern border on, on the uh, top side there. So a little bit more detail on, on, on the entrance point. And a an aerial as to the area that we're we're going to be dealing with on the south. And basically the cross section of northern boundary and southern parcel of Butts John's Landing. We're we're doing a pretty robust um, planting there of hibernum and uh, and smokes, uh, et cetera. And this will show you. You know the the species and um, planting um, plants, the landscape plant for that buffer. A little bit more drill down information in terms of the caliper and the size of trees, etc. If you you'd like to take a, a, a closer look, but um, um, hang on, yes. can we have one conversation in the room at a time, please? Okay. Thank you. The, the visual here is uh, something we had our landscape architects prepare so that uh, you can see the uh, buffer uh, that's planned. And this is a visual from John's Landing Way looking back to, to the property subject. This is a rendering of a larger section of, of that. I took this picture in my community of a of a pretty mature hibernum bush that's been there a while. The, the amount of privacy creates time. So pretty effective, I would think. This just shows distances from from um, uh, the entry point to John's Landing in terms of uh, of the. Um, amount of space there is between the boundary of our northern uh, side of the, of the parcel and the road, as well as the back ends of those properties on the entrance. We did get the letter um, from John's Landing HOA on Tuesday, August 2nd, uh, requesting a boundary wall fence between the communities, uh, which you know basically was a um, something late developing, so we, we bring it forth for discussion. This is an outline of the boundary wall that uh, accompanied the letter. I just superimpose the site plan as it as it relates to the three parcels to, to the deed, so we can get kind of a, a sense of, of how that interacts. 
about 84, 90, 91, as printed in the HOA uh, letter, uh, are really the, the uh, key um, problems that, that we need to deal with. Um, the home orientation, I, I wanted to note, exposes most of the side of the homes that they view. So we are we are very open to finding a solution to to this um, this issue of privacy, and just wanted to offer up some lots ninety ninety one again mostly the side of the homes that are exposed. Consideration a large majority of the lots 80, 84, 90, and ninety one that will face the rear of the Bayview properties are either the side of the home or backyard area that side of the fluid flow may, that may be there. The practical use and real re, uh, utility of, the, of these back uh, areas is less likely to create privacy issues with the back of the Bayview lots. And there's also a, a large public back. Um, and then I think the aesthetic considerations are, are something that, that needs to, to, to be, you know, talked about. And whatever the solution we, we end up coming up with, uh, I think it should complement their, their, their existing um, of weather of fence. And, and it's, it's a really nice monument with, with wrought iron connections. So, we in doing the um, the northern border um, solution on landscape, it just struck us that it would be an ideal solution to carry uh, through the, the eastern side rather than create a masonry or whatever wall behind the wall. Um, but again, we involved in that discussion and, and exchange of ideas. And we're open to to solving it in an equitable way. Be glad to take it. Um, yeah, questions from the table. Um, and if you have an answer to the lot sizes of the budding homes, otherwise we'll take it from. I do have that, man. I feel okay. Like I, know, I just looked that up. Um, I can provide that very quickly for you. Actually, I mean, if you go to the slide where the uh, lot legend is, Oh, so that Brad, if you have it, yes, sir. Yes, I am. Um, so the, the house in the I'll call the notch there at the bottom left, um, according to this according to the that property is approximately 1.5 acres in size. That lot there, and then the other two lots that are on uh, Largo Vista 715 and 716. Uh, 715 is uh, approximately a half acre in size. And 716 Largo Vista is approximately 0.6 acres in size. Okay. So those three that abut in those areas, those are those last size. Okay, and um, yes. I can't see you, but the lady that was uh, yeah, there. I, I think what the information he just gave you was not what he asked. What he asked was what the lakefront was, and our lakefront on lot 91 is 138 lengthwise. Theirs are all going to be 80, 80, 80. 80. So from so it's nowhere near what most of the lake stores are in John. Yeah, they're, they're stacked on top of each other. So I okay. What what is the average? What would you say the average with this? Ninety. Ours. Eighty is. And you, and which one are you to the right or right? We're uh, seven sixteen. We're the every single picture were the uh, house in the house. Which one? I'm sorry. Lot 91. Uh, lot 91. The very first one. Yeah, this one right here. Uh -huh. The lake front lot. I am yes, lake yeah. this one. All right. Okay. This one right here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. okay. There's 91 there. Oh, okay. Thank you. The lots, uh, lakefront lots are uh, basically 80 by 200. Mm -hmm. Anywhere from 220 to 250 depth. Yeah. So they're 0 0.41, 0 0.42, and 0 0.48 acres. Can you go to this picture, Ed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So lot number 91, 
What is the, not the debt, but the width? 138, that's your home? One, home? yeah, tell me what page, what, which one you're right. on. That one. Yeah, that one. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna look at you. I don't really know. This is my house right here. What's the width on the back to the lake? 138. 138. Okay. Lakefront. Lakefront. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the homes, lakefront, going east, in Tom's Landing, what is the average lakefront? Well, we studied that uh, in, in evaluating uh, comparable pricing. I don't have that information, but there was uh, one lot uh, in, in on the lakefront that's vacant um, that was very comparable in size. I, I don't have the specific information. The remaining was. And I can get the flat for you. I don't have that with me, but that's something that needs to be considered because ABP is Did nothing compared to 138. Mary, what's the depth of these lot, three lots? What's the depth? They're 80 feet. 200. Uh, 220 to 250. Yeah. Okay. The houses are long in there. So, do you also raise concern about the, the lake? And the docks, and whether you're going to have three docks all on top of each other at only 80 feet in width. Right. And okay. did we determine what the other ones to the east of your house were on an average? About 100. The same, she said. About the same. Yeah, they're all, they all should be over. Maybe starting that one that we, there's only one that's there. Maybe there is, there is one I recall. The other one, that house on the other side, it looked like it could even be. Wider picture. One next to me is even bigger than ours. No, I'm talking about on the it's other side of the side. West side. West side. The one that sold the property and John he's got a huge sir. lake front, but he owned all of that. So John he was the builder. Right, the, the west side. Right. And he owned the property previously. Yes. Yeah, he owned all of the property. Right. He and John Landing. Yes. Yeah. He's he and his brother. Yeah. He's working in road. Yeah. And they build houses in um Oakland Park. <coughs> J and J. I think it's J and J construction. Yes. That's so did you want to have the community speak? Yes, I will. But once we're done here. Okay. Rick, do you have all the information you need? Yeah. Sal? Uh, I have a few more questions. Okay. So this slide that shows the wall, proposed boundary walls, those are walls. That was uh, accompanied the HOA, a letter uh, stating that, you know, they were they were in support of the development, but this wanted to have some dialogue in terms of that privacy. So what they, I think they stated in the letter you guys have that preferably, Based on okay. Um, that would be like, I'd I mean, if, if they're asking for a masonry wall, isn't a brick wall preferable to a masonry? I would think aesthetically. Aesthetic? Yes. yes. I mean, and our, brick masonry. Well, the brick walls already exist. And that we're not this, by voting we're at now. No. Right. Oh, sorry, one second. Let me ask a question. Yeah, I mean, if I could the brick the wall. Yeah. You guys will have an is this brick wall more to south already existing? Yes, it is. Okay. As All right. And Steve, guys, okay? One conversation at a time. Well, let me say this. It is our understanding that it does exist. Uh, from what I was on, on the property, it does, it does appear to exist. Uh, to what degree it exists in terms of how long it is, et cetera. Uh, I don't know, but it seems that it, it even comes down okay. to that property. But I have another question, Steve. Sure. Are we even talking about brick walls at this no. point? <clears throat> no. So let's let's keep the conversation to what we're approving Thank tonight. You. Right. So so the the idea is the, the Johns Landing has asked for uh, walls to be constructed uh, as a as a buffer between. Mm -hmm. On the north side, there is already existing the wrought iron fence with the uh, brick monuments. And so what they're suggesting is, is buffering that with landscape rather than building a wall on the Bayview side. But are we, are we even discussing that tonight? 
Well, it's it's one of the considerations that John's Landing wanted to make sure uh, was discussed as as part of, at least as part of this moving forward. Right. Uh, and and further, I wanted to bring it forth, and perhaps I did do need to, but but I wanted to to kind of be have full disclosure in that regard, so that we we don't necessarily, uh, you know, that, that we're 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 armed with as much information as possible. To, to to discuss it and see how we can solve it. Okay. Um, honestly, it, it probably isn't part of this agenda, but probably would quickly become a uh, part of it uh, with community involvement. So anticipating that community involvement, we wanted to, you know, kind of talk about it and 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 see how we could solve it, you know. Aesthetically, and, and if it were my decision. I wouldn't want to have uh, what's existing, but then have another masonry, whatever that may be, behind the wall. But we could certainly put forward. Okay, so I'm sorry, but at this point, you're willing to discuss a wall. Absolutely. What that wall looks like. Well, we're, we're willing to discuss a privacy. Again, I okay, so a privacy buffer of some kind. Exactly. But when is the appropriate time to discuss this, what I'm asking? What what needs to happen is- I don't want to muddy the water here. I, I understand. What needs to happen is, and, and Brad can correct me uh, if I'm wrong here, but basically what staff's going to do, you know, what you're doing is, is approving this preliminary subdivision plan with 20 lots based off of the, the diameter that they've showed you. The next step in the process would be they're going to come back with construction plans. And with those construction plans, they're going to give us a landscape, a full-blown landscape plan. They've already kind of given you an idea of what they're looking to do. We're going to take that landscape plan and we're going to take our code and we're going to compare it to uh, that landscape plan to make sure that they meet the code. Because again, this is straight zoning. What we need as staff is if, if the intent is to also have additional above that code, we need to make sure that we are looking for that also, which would include this by Burnham buffer. Okay. If on that east side, you wanted to have the same kind of wrought iron fence and, a, and the same kind of viburnum buffer down that east side, then we need to make sure that we're looking for that and those construction plans um, so that when they get approved. So um, that and that's the missing piece is that east side. If you if you're in agreement that landscape buffer is is right on the north side, that that can move forward fairly easy. The east side, I don't believe there's anything in between the two subdivisions. Okay. There's there's nothing, there's no barrier between your house and this vacant property right now. There's no it's, it's, is it the same rod iron? It's the same rod iron. Okay. So so down so down that east side. So, oh, All right. Thank you. So we just need to know that we're looking for that additional buffer if that's the direction we need to move in. So that's where the this part of it is, but in general, what you're looking to do is approve this site plan with 20 lots. That's that's what's on the table tonight. So all the, the, the landscape, the buffer, all will come right. back. So all we really need to say for at this point is we agree there's going to be a buffer. We will get to the details of that buffer later. Yes. Okay, and how are you, are you going to let residents give their input? Because clearly they want to. Of course I do, and and that's uh, really the reason we wanted to give ours, and then and then be prepared to listen to what might be suggested. Otherwise, yeah, and that could take quite some time. I don't believe it should. I, I mean, I wouldn't think. I mean, it's it's rather easy. It's either a landscape buffer or it's some sort of more hard. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. Okay. You should know that. <laughs> I, I don't mean to simplify, but it just seems like it's you know A or B. All right. Well, we still we got to get to that point. Let's just kind of do and just a nice problem. Point of clarification, because we we're having a discussion on the lakefront lots. Um, they vary all the way across here. Um, we've got the property appraiser pulled up, and they've got lot widths on here anywhere from 142, 85, 79. Um, I can't read 99. that. 99. That's, that's the largest one, 170. 170. So the, the lots do vary uh, as the terrain goes across there. So what they have on the wall. And I forgot to ask earlier. Oh, thank you. Okay. For a minute. 
Okay. So just 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 to put that out there, they go anywhere from from eighty five to one seventy. So this should all be worked out at the staff level. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This I, should not be coming to us I, in this condition. It really should not. There was some there was some gaps in in that in that uh, process that that we're trying to shore up. You know. Uh, as best as we can. Well, I'll tell you the simple problem for me right now that I wouldn't be ready to do anything on. Does that lakefront? I'm not ready to. Do it. Yeah. I'm not ready. Does that lakefront? There's too many. Two or, two or three. And until Hang we on. get to that, then. I'm just trying to look over because I'm lost. <laughs> so I'm just looking at my phone. So. Uh, and I, this is me personally. I'm so not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Either way. Um, I'm not comfortable at this point Me either. with the discrepancy between Lake Box, whether that should be three or whether you need somehow to cut that down to two. I think this is something, something, that, something that you guys should work on before we. Even I think and I think that once you've worked on it, I think that that's something that we should be discussing in our one on ones so that when we come to the table, we yeah. know what's yeah. what where the gaps are. We know what we need to do. And this is just two way this far. As I just question from our our vantage point, um, we are compliant from from the code sense and the design. I mean, right. unsanitary is yet to be to be determined. But and and planning and zoning uh, commissioners approved and and uh, staff recommended approval after a great deal of of exchange and information um, vetting. So the issue of, of lots on the lake would be, I'm not sure I understand. So just, just to, to clarify, it's, this is based on the neighborhood general design district with 70 foot lots. So having the 80 foot lots is actually exceeds what the, 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 the code calls for, mm -hmm. as I understand it. Mm -hmm. So the 80 foot lots um, are reasonable and also uh, they're the same uh, you know, we we approved eighty and eighty five lots over at, at on Lake Apopka with MI Homes, so there is some consistency here with the size of the lots. You can put docks on eighty foot lots, um, and these lots are also on sewer. So as far as the size of the lots, they don't have to be as big as the ones that are in John's Landing. Um, but be that as it may, the the eighty foot lots on the lake are consistent with the code. I just don't feel like this is buttoned up enough. Right for us to make an informed decision without too many variables that have been addressed at the staff or the PNC level. Um, I don't know. I mean, we're in an open meeting. I could say a lot of things that I'm just not going to right. go down that road. I don't think this is buttoned up enough for us to vote on this tonight. I think there are some open issues that need to be addressed. So when it comes to us, and it, I don't know if it needs to go back to PNZ because I don't think PNZ should have pushed it to us in this condition. Well, I just here, don't. And here's the thing with it: they might have thought that it was buttoned up enough, and and, and you might have thought, but as it comes to us, it's clearly not. And may, may I ask um, what the path from here to buttoned up? Being. That is a path for Steve to figure out with Brad. Um, I think that um, maybe tonight with this discussion of we need input, right. input doesn't, input is, this is not the proper place for input. Um, once it's buttoned up and we know what we are, what's being recommended, then we take input, but it becomes less, mm -hmm. not, not as much as we have sitting on the table right now does that steve do you not agree no uh, i i completely understand i, I know where it is. you understand i understand where you want to be and just further i mean we follow the process and and, and that led us here. And, and again yeah. isn't that, it's, we're not questioning yeah. what you're following or what you didn't follow we're just saying it's not enough for us at this point yeah it's just this isn't what i you know this isn't what we normally get right at this point we get something that Though you know, I think there's issues that didn't come up come up at where whatever time that they should have come up. So I'm happy to take limited, succinct input from residents tonight. 
so that you guys can go back and come up with something to bring back to us. Okay. How's that sound? That's fine. I mean, that's really... The I'm not saying that nobody, that people did something wrong. I'm just saying for whatever reason, Sacco we have something here that isn't... Incomplete. It, that's not complete. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I would all the town departments. We were under the impression that we were. I know. I'm I'm not faulting you. Yeah. So at all. I, we're we're all ears. Okay. So can I ask him one more question before? No, no, you ain't allowed, sir. Lake front lots. Is there a swell and burn system behind it? It looks like it is, but so, like do you have a swell and burn behind your house? Yes. So do you have a swell and burn? Uh, you yes, we have, a, we have a swell along the south side of uh, Catherine to run off in the laws before it enters the lake. Okay. But the swell is different because our development was done so much earlier that's required now. So the swell, that? that's an Orange County can requirement, correct? Uh, that'd probably be the water management. It's for management, it's not up, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. All right. So what I want now is I don't want. Uh, Anything? Yeah, you can sit down. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, look how fancy he's going back to that chair. This is what happens when meetings go past nine o'clock. Sorry, <laughs> um, we are not productive. We are not. We are not at a point where we can make good decisions, and I'm not going to make bad decisions on something that is this important. Um, so what I am asking for from the residents is I'm hearing you about you want some kind of privacy barrier. And it's I think it's up to um, Ed and Steve or and Brad to come up with what those options are. So we know that, correct? Yes. Um, not today. Not today. No, right. this is for going forward. I'm trying to I'm trying to cut down comment here. Um, the second one is there's a concern about the lakefront widths, um, swale and berm. Um, that is, or that's water management probably, but we'll no, that, work out what it is. That'll be part of the construction plan. Yeah. I had a question about you were talking to wildlife management about some kind of weird animal that I don't know anything about. Jay. Yeah, uh, well, I know blue jays. And um, over tortoises, what about eagles? So you're talking to them about eagles? Well, uh, say yes. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> 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 it's bad. Uh, issue is uh, we, we're going to have a swim lane, but it's only 90 day. Uh, I know you said it had a shelf life. I heard that. We're going to do that a little later on and permit it. So to make sure that there's that it's still. Well, what about eagles? Eagles, we will look into, obviously. That's great. Thank you. All right. Look at go back to that chair again. <laughs> okay. Now, audience, residents, what else? Are you concerned about at this point? I'm going to let up here, right? <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to let our board president go first. Okay, and please come up and tell us who you are because we need it for the record. Chief board president. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Mayor and Councilman. Um, I just wanted to but, what's your name, please? Sorry, Charmaine Porter, and I am the president of the John Sanding Women's Association. Um, we just wanted to voice our concerns. We're trying to put into a letter, the board put into a letter to both the town and to the developer. Um, the buffer wall is, and I know you are going to get it, is a big concern of ours. The main concern is it's part of the main entry into our community. Um, those homes in Bay, like uh, Bayview, again, their backs are going to be onto our main entrance. Our own property that back onto that entrance has a wall, a proper more wall. Okay. We don't have a fencing. Um, I don't think our residents or our community is going to be happy with um, any sort of landscaping there. We have obviously who's going to maintain it, number one. And we do need something that's a better buffer than just landscaping when you come into our community. The other big concern is 
I'm not sure if you're aware, but John's Landing has two sections to it. It has a section that was developed by a developer, and Lago Vista homes on both sides are our estate section, which are much larger. They are all custom homes. The three that are on abutting the new development are all custom homes. So we obviously have a concern if we have any depreciation in housing prices because we've got these commu this community with their backyards abutting actually our community, that it is going to cause an issue for prices in our community and also affect our community as a whole. So those are some of the issues we have there. We have a couple of others that we wanted to raise to the town. Um, there is a mention of taking water or from Lago Vista. We're not engineers. The question was, does that affect our water pressure? What is the situation with that? Uh, we don't expect an answer now, but that's something that we are concerned about. Um, I think, oh, and then the traffic down Remington Road. I know that you said there's going to be very little impact onto it. I'm not sure if you are aware if you come down Remington Road at any of the peak times, it is an issue since the racetrack has been built. So we have an issue with traffic both ways. The traffic will back up almost to the turnpike with people trying to turn into Remington Road. We have another issue with our, we are gated community, traffic coming into our community, going up Remington Road. Um, at the moment, you have a uh, right turn into John's Cove. Everybody trying to go straight ends up backed up because our community is trying to turn in. There is no space there. Um, going up to the traffic light from our community, problem there too. So, okay. Well, it sounds like, a, you know, we'll, we will address it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other issue? Come on up and tell us who you are. My name is Grimmy Brown. I live in Johnson. I have a question for the development team. Are there going to be any back porches on the second floor of any of their homes? Um, that, oh, yeah. that really is uh, to be determined. I don't know if there's many inquiry models and where they do. Um, but that's something that we can make a use for for more detail. You're going to have a design and it could be designed for but is there back porches I don't think you're gonna have 12 homes back in that dogs because you know the GI theory of the east. Yes. Uh there's a 12. There's at the one, west and three and four five. And, and you still have oh, the one. Okay. Point is, I guess, that you don't want second story porches overlooking people's houses. So then five or six, we'll make note of that and take a look at it. Fence or anything to gotcha. be concerned. I understand. And that will come in with different we'll, things we'll we look at. We'll take a look at that and we'll know this. To make sure that that doesn't exist. Okay. Well, we'll, we will address it. That doesn't mean, you know, that means that we'll talk about it again. Um, I'm Kelly Delatry, and I own lot 191, which is the main lot that's going to be affected on the water. Um, the only other things I know they've said traffic, water pressure. There was also an issue, um, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but another developer tried to put 10 houses on there, and there was a concern about fire vehicles getting in and out. So I would like to know how that sums up with. 20 houses. Well, this isn't going to have a gate, which makes a big difference. Okay. Well, and I'd also like you to look at the ratio size of 20 houses on that one little piece versus John's Landing. Understand. It's very different. Um, the other thing is I also thought a uh, long time ago when we still lived there, there was a single buyer that was going to put one big house and the, I don't even the remember that. Required, they were requiring a park. In addition to the retention pond, they were requiring a park. That doesn't look like that is anywhere in these particular. Those are different um, agreements based. I get it. I'm just on race. Okay. Gotcha. What the city Noted. has considered previously, which I think Noted. is important. Uh, I don't remember that at all. The other thing that, that possibly makes a lot of people happy is you have the retention pond here with all the houses abutting. Why don't you flip it? 
put the houses over there and the retention fund. My, it's just a suggestion, and I'm saying maybe you could consider that because that would alleviate all the five houses here. Well, three of the houses and probably maybe one of the, the top. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. 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 Noted. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Now that was orderly. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate everybody's patience. And I promise that the next time we get together, we'll put it further up on the agenda. <laughs> so I like to have a little more patience than I do right now. I'm sorry, but I just really feel that after an hour and a half, you're not making good decisions. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm at 809. Remember, after an hour and a half. I know, you know, I know. I'm one of the houses, a two story greenhouse. When you come into the subdivision, if you look to the left, I'm right there. And I'm glad this gentleman mentioned about second story balconies looking back in. Yep. The format they had also was showing garages basically opening it up as we all come into our subdivision. So we were actually talking about seeing if they would be willing. And again, just as we're trying to spit fire here, because I don't know how all this process we're spitballing because all of exactly. sudden, you're right. Hey, this thing's approved. And they're going to put shrubs in. Developers want to get. Oh, in. We're not even close to that. Okay, but that's where something with a wall, where they would backfill with our where our wrought iron is, mm -hmm. and that would then keep the continuity of the four homes running along the back side of the entrance. It would give that nice view. But um, I don't know when that. How fast that. Well, we'll know. I used all an idea for everyone to look at. So thank you. All right. This was a whole lot of fun, um, but I do. Yes, sir. Uh, just a question that, um, and, and good feedback from everybody, which we will. Are you going to talk about eagles? <laughs> just say yes. Yeah. Come on, come on, come on. Information so well. It is getting to bedtime. Um, but it's past mine. I, but my question is that, that a lot of the points that have been raised seems to be something that will be ahead of us in terms of design standards. And exactly. like well, and but at least you can, yes. when you do your presentation, you can say, yeah. we're going to talk about that then. And I would say that organically, I don't know that Ashley Woods is going to necessarily want to be selling homes with balconies overlooking other homes necessarily. So there's an organic direction as well that could, could happen. But uh, again, we're prepared to to step it through. And Good, and I, I'm glad that you guys have an open mind about yes. taking feedback. I really am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, I just have one question. How, how can we find, because I didn't know about the last meeting. So it's, we publish the agendas Thursday before the meetings on every second and fourth Tuesday of the month, except we have budget meetings this month, which is the only time in the whole year that we change our meetings. That's true. It's general, but if you Google Oakland, Florida Town Commission agenda, I promise like I can I will have our whole community here because I think there's more people that would like to know. Yeah, it's it's published on the town. It's published on the town website Thursday prior to the meeting. And Facebook. We're hoping after all the community does come with you. Yeah, we like answers, right? Believe it or not. We'll have a lot of these answers already, like yeah. the, the wall. I mean, yeah. But, we should talk about that we'll here. Keep this up late. So what the heck? All right. Are we done? Are we finished? All right. Hey, hey, hey. Wait, wait, wait. She didn't get the best part. I'd like a vote on it, though. We got a vote on it, right? Oh, to table it? Yes, we can. I need a motion. I'll make a motion to table the Bayview at John's Lake preliminary site, site plan. Till a date to be determined. To a, to, a, to a date to be determined. I'll second it. All right, moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Now you can. Now you can go. All right, guys. I love you, but get out. <laughs> okay.
still have a meeting. Hey, 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 over. Hi, hi. We can't, we can't leave yet. All right, make them stay until the meeting. Oh, all right, now. Yeah. Oh, well, well. Lock the door. Excuse us, please. We do have to finish the meeting. Please, either sit down or vacate the premises. Thank you. No, not you, Stephanie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Take care. Get her. <laughs> we haven't got the yes yet. <laughs> we asked me, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, Joseph? Uh, well, not, do I have anything? Oh, no, I'm good. Okay, what about you? Do I have anything for the internet meeting? For, do you have anything to talk about as a commissioner? Oh, um, Tri County Lee is going to start still going to start a survey probably the beginning of September. Um, just asking different questions, trying to get more people involved. So we're going to get a survey and email, and I know Lisa get it, and she'll make sure that we get it and, and fill it out. But some of the things are about having meetings at night time to try to, you know, get more people to come out. So the cool. so survey will come from the Mikey? I wouldn't dream of it. I don't have anything in, the, in that spirit. I have nothing either. So got that, man. Uh, just I sent out information on the front flag this morning. I saw that. So uh, just point of clarification, you know they're going to down the pedestrian bridge. They they said it on, on all the 11. I do not know when the road bridge is going to open. They will have pedestrians on the road bridge. But I don't know when the cars will be allowed. Are we? Do we still think maybe just September? Because that's the answer I'm giving. Okay. So there's okay. still a little bit of finished work there, but they are moving ahead with you know moving the production. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. All right, anything else? Kathy, please. Kathy, please. Kathy, that's what you need. I do have a few things. <laughs> <laughs> Take your life in your hands. All right, I'll, 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 go ahead, please. That's in January 9 33. <laughs> wow, that's the first time in your what twelve years? Yeah, you didn't part in mind it. 